So it's Dr. Dr. Lee Breeze is an independent crop consultant from Central North Dakota. He provides agronomic co consulting service directly to growers, including fertility, pest management, crop management, precision ag, reduced till, cover crop management. Lee earned his Doctor of Plant Health degree at the Uni University of Nebraska in 2019. So think about this. He's got a lot of acres. He's got crop consultants working under him. And he still went to Nebraska and got his, he lives in Jamestown. And he, he went to Nebraska and, and got his doctor's degree. So I mean, it's a, and in 2017, he won the International uh, Crop Advisory Award, the International. So I mean, I was, uh, what I like about Lee, he tries to, he looks at things a little differently because he tries to make sense of things by not getting really high tech. So anyway, with no further ado, I okay. welcome Lee. I think I turned on the right button. Is the mic working? Okay. Shake your hand. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good. Um, I tend to be kind of a skeptic, so don't be surprised by that. Um, I have a ton of slides, and I don't get any more lunch if I get through them all. <laughs> so if you want to talk about something else, if you want to interrupt me, if you want to ask questions, I would much prefer to do that. I don't, rather than getting through my agenda, so feel free at any time to interject, interrupt, argue, disagree, that's cool. All right, these are just my opinions and what I've seen, and that's what I want to share with you, okay? Now, my opinion evolves and changes when I get good information. So this may not be the same thing I say in five years, because five years ago I didn't say the same thing I'm saying now. I continuously learn, and I think that's why everybody's here, so hopefully I can learn from you as well. When we talk about these principles and guidelines, we've all seen them. They're, they're everywhere around here, and, and they're really good uh, places to start. Um, and I'm going to say that I don't think they're laws or rules or regulations. I think they're guidelines and good principles, and I think you can use them and interact with them. There's one that I think is missing often in this. So that's, it's kind of a given. But this is really about profitability right we have to stay profitable it's wonderful to talk about great things for our soil and the environment those are all really good if nobody's paying you to do it it's pretty hard to keep doing it okay so I think that's a, an important part and this is something that that frames a lot of the things that I talk about and the way that I look at things so I hope it frames that for you as well so how do you get started on this thing because I was tasked with this whole putting it all together well, I think you have to assess your farm, specifically. What's going on on your farm, in your field, on a specific acre? What do you need to address? What works for you? I think it's that personal, it's that specific. Uh, it's great to hear what's going on in, in Canada, in Oklahoma, in Kansas, in Ontario, and all those other places, but what's happening on your farm is what's really critically important. Because those are the things that you need to manage. So what do you see? And here's the thing that actually trips me up a lot of times. I go to farms, I go to a new farmer, I'm looking at his fields, I'm digging in his soil, I'm seeing something very different than he sees. I'm gonna ask you to go home from here and take a look at your farm with new eyes. Because we all expect to see certain things and we kind of put them in our brains and if you're there every day, you may not notice some of the changes or some of the obvious things. I'm going to show you some pictures of people miss obvious things. And then where can you make the most gain? What's most important? Start there. Or, or whatever you've done, what's the next most important thing for you? Okay? So here's, you know, some of the things that we've learned over time is that erosion is a terrible thing. And it can be devastating. And these are old pictures. Or are they? Okay, folks. And this literally was Earth Day. I'd like to say that these are all old pictures. But they're not. Okay, the one before was a grower I work with was no-till on the one side and the neighbor did some summer fallow because he didn't get it planted. He worked it a couple of times to manage the weeds. 
and there were six to eight inches of sand along the fence line and it went out for 200 yards. This one, this road, that sign is just across the road as you turn the corner and I'm sitting right at the intersection, eight more than 50 yards away. Both sides of the road for miles is no-till soybean. Has been no-till for over 10 years. I don't think I have to explain this one. In North Dakota and many places our soil is black, or our snow is black and our soils are white. Some may write. Okay. This is a drone photo that I, I picked up a drone just because of this whole ag tech thing and my growers are like really you need to get into this and I haven't figured out a way to make any money on it but boy can I see saline spots. <laughs> This is an important view, because you don't see this from the ground. This is kind of what I'm talking about, have new eyes when you look at your fields and your farms and the whole thing. You don't see how devastating this is. This is a different crop. This is soybean, this is barley. Look at the difference. Anybody want to farm this quarter? How profitable is that? Is this guy making any money? I want you to look with new eyes and maybe it makes a new perspective. If you know somebody who's got a Cessna, get up in the air and take a look. You know somebody's got a drone, have them come out and take some pictures. At least look at it with different eyes. My friends have called job security. <laughs> That's solid kochia in a barley field. Resistant to four different herbicides. That's solid kochia in a soybean field. I think there's issues out there. I'm not saying you have them. I'm saying your neighbors do. <laughs> and if you can't see what's wrong with your farm, just ask your neighbor, because he knows. Okay? <laughs> So that's the whole point, you know, and talk about systems, because this is really where it goes. It's not, with this whole idea of finding a problem, solve a problem, is, is what's led us down the path that we're at, okay? So when we start talking about weeds, and even now, weed scientists are really common to say that, you know, there's a lot of herbicide resistance, but there's no weeds resistant to tillage. I've heard that several times. I'm sure some of you have heard that. First of all, that's a lie. Because quackgrass loves tillage, it's a good way to spread it, okay? Tillage has never been very successful at killing Canada thistle, okay? So it's a lie. But it's a single-minded type of situation where you're looking at one problem and you're trying to figure out all solutions for that one problem, ignoring the issues of erosion, soil loss, soil health, and it aggregates by doing tillage, okay? So I don't want to talk about problems, I want to talk about systems where you think about everything. And I don't think they have to be complicated. Derek is doing amazing things, but my head was swimming yesterday. Anybody with me? He's doing a lot of stuff, boys. And that's cool and more power to him, but I don't think it has to be that complicated. Now, he didn't start there either. Keep that in mind. It's evolved over time and moved and grown and, and gone. So he's at a different position in his soil health journey than other people are, and that's totally cool. I always tell folks, if you want to learn how to play piano, you don't start with Beethoven. You start with Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. And you work up from there and you build your skills, right? This is the idea behind this. It's you can get to do cool things in the event, but you're only adding one or two things. You're not adding 10 or 20. So that's my idea with that. Start where you're at. And again, I don't think there's, all, there's rules. I think you can take and choose and do what you want. Like Derek talks about it's really, really hard for him to do cover crops. He just doesn't have enough time. Okay. He's getting plant diversity through intercropping. It's a different way to do it. If you didn't have the opportunity to do intercropping, get all that plant diversity, I still think <laughs> reducing your tillage, keeping the soil armored, and keeping it covered is all positive gains. What I don't want people to do is come to these meetings where there's fantastic people and go, God, I'll never do that. I can't do that. I'm not going to try. Every gain is worthwhile. So here's my simple system. 
And, and, and you can blow holes in this left and right. Like this is not a system, it's not a rotation, it's a terrible idea. The fact is this is where most of agriculture's at in the Midwest. That's where it's at. Corn and soybean. That's where the production's at. Okay? There's our soil health principles in there. Those gains are worth it. If I can get a corn soybean conventional guy to pull off this fall tillage, reducing his erosion over winter, that is a huge gain. And it's worthwhile. If I can get them to try direct seeding a few fields, it's worthwhile. Okay? But these guys haven't done this stuff before. Maybe you haven't done this stuff before, and there's some tripping points that can really hurt you. And actually, this idea of being stupid wet in North Dakota and South Dakota like we are is going to force people into direct seeding, but we all know that isn't the right condition for the first try. So I think there's going to be a lot of challenges and a lot of stress and a lot of failures with it. And guys are going to say that no-till doesn't work. We tried that in 2020 after 19. It doesn't work. Dude, you planted, tried to plant it in the mud with no soil structure. It's not going to work. It's not really no-till. Diversity. I'm trying to get guys to add a third crop into this. It makes a huge difference, especially if you can add a small grain. Now you've got time to do other things. You've got time to add in cover crops if you want to. But just adding that third crop changes the system. I've seen it. And if people want to add livestock, we can broadcast cover crops in the corn, or if you just want to add the living root, if you don't really want to deal with the livestock. So I've taken a corn and soybean system, I've hit one, two, three, four properties, principles of soil health, with a couple of practices. Now I'm not saying this is the end of the game, but I'm saying this is a system that improves on it. But it has to be a system so that they understand that the tillage is part of it. Reducing tillage is part of it gets you into this. Having the living root helps you reduce the tillage. So in this system, I'd actually rather start here, broadcasting that cover into the corns, get that CRI out there, direct seed that into the CRI next year so it gives them some trafficability, and there's a higher success rate of that. This year, we're going to come into a preventive plant that I want to see cover crops on. I'd like to see a lot of CRI, and I'd like to see those things set up for soybean, potentially corn. If it's going to be corn, I'm going to change my mix a little bit but to give them traffic ability so they can direct seed it. That's the thinking ahead of the system. It's not just, well, the problem's water, I'm gonna dig it out, right? This can work, but broadcasting corn is more hit and miss than a lot of other things, especially the 30 inch row corn. That's why 60, it's one of the reasons 60 inch row corn's a big deal. But we've seen it work. This is rye, that's it. It's still adding diversity. And you can argue with me and say, that's not enough. Okay, I'm with you. But it's adding diversity and it's making a difference in this and that's moving in the right direction. And this is what it looked like after harvest. And we see these results fairly commonly. Here are some of the stumbling blocks for these folks, for the beginners, whether that's you or your neighbor. Residue management, right? How fun is that first time in no-till when you didn't pay attention to the combine? That's really tough, but they don't know that unless you talk to them or tell them. So if you're that guy, don't raise your hand, but I'm telling you, manage your residue is your first thing for no-till. It's one of the main things you want to do. Get it back to where it came from, okay? Broadcasting cover crops, weather and herbicides are two big stumbling blocks. I think herbicides get blown way out of proportion in my opinion. I've been testing this a little bit in some acres in the corner that don't get seeded and I think herbicides are blamed for a lot of failures that are not related to herbicides. This last summer we had this monstrosity cricket population. Like they were everywhere. The ground would move with these little buggers. And broadcasting rye was feeding the crickets. They love that stuff. And there was a lot of failures with the broadcast rye that were blamed on herbicide when there's 30 crickets per square foot. And they were eating the germ. You look at the rye seed, you could see they ate the germ off the rye seed and went to the next thing. Now, I'm not ready to condemn crickets. Guys are like, well, I should have sprayed the crickets. Well, they eat seeds. They don't just, they're not particular to whether it's rye or water hemp. <laughs> they're my buddy. Yeah, I'm okay with that. But understand, if you put it in the soil, you protected it from the cricket. So it was more of a misapplication by broadcasting it in that situation. Okay. 
All of this helps out. The traffic ability, I think, is one of the first stumbling blocks. When you get that new quarter, when you start getting into this, trying to get out and get across it before you've built your soil structure. I think that's why you need the plants and the cover crops and the diversity first in a lot of systems to do this. And then the water management. I put a note on there to show, show pictures. I, I'm sure you guys have seen this kind of yeehaw, like water, water everywhere. So this is a grower I work with. I don't work with all no-till guys. This is the grower that I work with, and I'll show you another field of his that he's finally caving a little bit. This is what he had to do this fall because that field's gonna be too wet. And there's my pictures, and there's the picture of my boots. Kitty corner across the corner, 50 yards away, is this field that I've been arm twisting him on. Same soil type, same field, same thing. Two years worth of no-till. I'll take this one every day. This one's still too wet. Like that's still too wet. But it's a lot easier to manage. I got the guy to do one field and I'm thrilled. That is a huge gain. He doesn't like it. He complains about it. That no-till, rah, 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 rah. He did two fields this fall. I'm hoping for 100% in time. Right, it's going to take time. His dad hates it. So let's talk a little bit about stepping it up a ton, a tad. I'm, I'm, never, I'm not going to even talk about how to get the Derrick's level because I'm not sure I know how to do that. Adding diversity in the living root. Three to four cash crops. Three to four crops that you know how to make money on. And so covers can be your cash crop if you can run them through livestock. Right? They can bring back finances to you. And to me, that's one of the really, really good ways to add livestock in, is that they help make covers pay. And I'm good with that. So if you, if you can do that, that can be your third or fourth cash crop. But what I've seen in rotation systems with guys that are even conventional tillage guys, when they have four crops in their system, things change for the better, management-wise. Weed pressure goes down, disease pressure goes down, water management increases just by having extra crops. And I'm not even talking about wild crops, corn, soybean, wheat, and barley. Three of those are grasses. Wheat and barley are almost the same thing, but they are planted at a little bit different time. They do canopy at a little bit different time, and they do harvest at a little bit different time, and it makes a difference. It makes a difference. And the weed thing you'll hear people talk about, well, you can use different herbicides in those, no. We're not using different herbicides and different crops. Not by, a, not by a long stretch. A little bit different, but not a lot different. It's about timing, canopy, harvest, planting, different biology, different type of plant makes a huge difference on that. It makes a difference on insect populations and pathogens as well. You start adding reduced tillage to this and you really start getting some, some oomph in this system. You really start getting some things that are working because you're not destroying your biology year in and year out. You're allowing that to proliferate and continue to grow. You add a longer living root into that with the cover crops, now you really got something cool going on, okay? So I'm asking growers to put in three cash crops, adding the small grain so they can put cover crops behind the small grain, maybe still applying some broadcast stuff into their corn. And this is a pretty good soil health system. I've seen guys get to this level and just kind of hang out here, and I've seen huge changes in their soils. Good changes, reduced erosion, reduced salinity, better nutrient cycling, all kinds of cool stuff, better traffic ability. You want to plant 12 crops, more power to you. I don't think it has to be that complicated. Strip till works. And I think one of the things about strip till is it's really, really expensive in my opinion. And I think no till can work anywhere. But strip till helps people manage water. If you're having trouble establishing cover crops and getting cover crops to work in your system, strip till can help you manage water. As the cover crops have been using to help us manage water. So that's another way to do it. And I'm okay with it. Like it's reducing the tillage by a lot. Specifically if they're only stripping in front of corn. So one out of three years they're doing a strip till. Guys are hell bent on they got to place their fertilizer or their phosphorus at a certain point. Fine. That's a really good way to do it. I don't think you have to do that. I don't think you have to do a lot of things. But it works. So okay, cool. If that's where you're at and that's what you're comfortable with, do it. 
And here's a really simple thing that a lot of people don't do. Your fields don't have to be quarters, or 80s, or 40s, or square. Well, hell, nothing in North Dakota is square. The boundary is, but you can see there ain't a whole lot of square in there. Okay, this is the road, heavily saline affected. You can see some saline effect here and here on this corner and over here. The roads dam up the water and they contribute to our saline problem. We ended up putting long-term grass in here. This is in CRP. I, I would rather have it in some type of hay or forage or grazing because I think that's a better managed system. But rather than farming the salt ground, we put it into something else where the landowner's making some money. Then here is kind of the next level where there's a lot of water and there's a little bit of salinity. Instead of planting soybeans, which don't grow in salinity, we planted rye, which can and can yield. It doesn't grow everywhere, but it grows a lot further than the soybeans do. And he didn't have to have a thousand acres of rye. He had 150 total. And that was doable for this guy. And we planted the soybeans. Where did the soybeans grow? Concept, right? <laughs> like, put them where it works. Like, so these are three different fields in that quarter. And they're actually not that hard to manage. There isn't even that many boundaries or borders or any of that kind of stuff. Like, if you were to spray it and plant it, the whole thing. Now you want to ramp it up a hair. This is a half section. This guy's got six crops. I don't even have them all in here. Um, this is saline management area. We're not even really using the cash crop on here. This is a lot of cover crops. If he gets a little hay off it, it's a bonus. Okay. This is corn that had a ton of Goss's wilt. We got hit with that with a poor variety one year, but the corn was still pretty good. This is a saline spot. Corn, again, doesn't like saline, so we didn't plant corn there. Planting corn in the saline spot is negative $350 an acre. That's what it is. So we put $30 worth of barley in there and came out positive $75 an acre. That was a swing of over 400 bucks on those acres. Anybody got time to plant five acres of barley for that? I would think so. Okay, and granted the barley sucked. We didn't put any fertilizer on it. We didn't hardly spray it. We just treated it as a cover crop and we were able to harvest some barley out of it. Same thing in here. This is a soybean field with some barley around all of those spots in the really bad saline areas. You can see you probably should have went a little further, but you got to draw the line somewhere. And that's what he did. Drew the line somewhere. Doesn't mean that we can't manage this acre better, but we've managed more. We're gaining on it, getting somewhere on it, going somewhere on it. That's kind of the point. His profitability is going through the roof with the soil health system. We're just farming the, the acres like they should be farmed, like what works. Start adding three and four crocs, crops, marketing becomes a significant issue. Now, when I listen to a lot of these guys that do a lot of the soil health stuff, one of the things they're really, really good at is finding value added markets. These guys are selling seed, they're going into org organic markets, they're going into food grade markets, they're going into value added stuff, they're going into the, the grass-fed beef type of things, things that people are paying them more for. One of the best successes I hear from these guys is how they market their crops. They actively seek out better markets. I think every farmer should do that. But take that page from their book and they'll all talk about it, but they don't really talk about it as being one of the key things to this. I think it is one of the key things to this because the profitability is super important. Find ways to market and get value out of what you're doing but you're not gonna haul flax to the local elevator. You can put it in your system. I read this point in my area, small grains are a specialty. Okay. Here's the other stumbling block. So I, I'm all on board with livestock additions, but let's be honest, cows aren't for everybody. Right? It's a different type of management. And there are some cash crop guys that have no business owning cows. And you know this. I know this. I grew up on a ranch that had all kinds of stuff. I'm not a cow guy, I'm a plant guy. I know this and I know where my limitations are. Doesn't mean you can't have cattle in your system, right? With you guys, your, your grazing trades and all that kind of stuff. And you can have the neighbor come in, graze your stuff, manage the cattle. Derek was talking about doing some of that too. That's a really good good way to do it but I think trying to get a cash crop guy who doesn't have the constitution to grow cattle is a train wreck waiting to happen and a really expensive one 
And then this second system, if you're going to go into strip till, you're going to, you know, now you're starting to buy more machinery and change things out. The, the no-till excuse is my drill can't do no-till is a lie anymore. It maybe was true 10, 20, 30 years ago, but there's a lot of drills that'll work, even if they're not specifically designed for it. But when guys are learning about no-till, they have to learn how to set that drill. That's the first thing they have to learn. It's no longer fluff at four inches from end to end on the corner, right? Your soils change rapidly, change with the residue, they change moisture-wise, they change texture-wise. Setting the drill and learning how to do that is really important. The other thing a conventional guy will argue with is down pressure. He will freak out when you hit 100 pounds of down pressure. Anybody run under two, 300 pounds of no-till? 400 pounds, Derek was showing up there. Sometimes you gotta give her to coals to get her in the ground, right? Seed placement's really important. These guys are all worried about compaction. Do you worry about sidewall compaction and no-till? Not near as much because you have structure, right? So changes your problem. Okay, I'm gonna ramp it up a little bit, not, not Derek Axton level, but this diversity armor thing, the intercropping stuff. We, I had a grower play with this this year. This is really cool. This is really cool. I'm super excited with it. Um, I think there's a lot of cool things you can do. It's easy to get more in four cash crops when you start adding two in one, one field. That's pretty cool. And then you got all kinds of room for covers. So your intercropping doesn't necessarily have to be a harvested crop or something that you're planning on. It can just be a crop in there for a reason to help your other crop. Like chickpeas and flax are an example. Flax with chickpeas reduces ascochyta dramatically, better than any fungicides do. So then these guys are getting away from fungicides. They got the flax in there to help with it. Helps with standability, helps with disease. And whatever flax they get's a bonus. And a lot of guys are setting their combine to kick the flax out the ass end just because it's a cover crop now to grow. So you can add several covers in this kind of system because you can grow two at one time. You can grow the oats and peas together, whatever you want. There's opportunity in there. This living root livestock, so overwintering covers and cover crops, and then the perennials is really important. That's a, to me, that's another level that we need to get in agriculture. We need to get more perennials into these systems. And you can put perennials in a cash cropping system. You can definitely do it. Alfalfa is worth a lot of money. Even orchard grass can be worth a fair amount of money. Okay? Those things can be done. But the idea of these 60 inch rows is maybe even putting a perennial cover crop in between those 60 inch rows and farming those strips in alternating years is another way that we can possibly do this. So there's a lot of ways to do that. The nice thing about those perennials is that long-term living root, okay? They're out there doing all kinds of work. There's consistency for the microbes, consistency for soil building. There's a lot of stuff going on. The other thing about perennials is that their nutrient demands are different. Like when we think about corn, corn gets really, really hungry at certain life stages. Keeping up with the nitrogen demands of corn at certain times of its life stage is really, really hard for your soil. A perennial has a longer, slower time than it wants nutrients. So it's much easier for your soil to provide those. I was talking to a guy earlier about this. It's kind of the water heater thing, okay? When everybody's getting ready for church in the morning, family is six at my house, everybody's getting ready for church in the morning. If everybody wants to take a shower, somebody's going to get a cold one. Yeah? Okay. Well, your soil supplying nutrients and do, through all this biology and all these fun things that we're talking about is kind of like the water heater. There's a reservoir and you draw upon it and then that gets refilled. The biology helps refill that, but it does take time. Okay? So when you have a high demand crop like corn and potentially soybeans in these systems, it's harder for that biology to keep the hot water supply when that crop is hungry. When you look at it, a perennial system, that, that crop gets hungry at, at times, but not near as hungry as that corn does or that soybean does for a short period of time. So it's like everybody taking a shower every two or three hours. The water here's got plenty of time to re refill and everybody gets a hot shower. I think that's a key for some of these guys that are able to reduce their fertility. I think that's a key. I think that's really important that, that they're using different types of plants that have different demands at different times and not everybody's hungry at the trough or standing there waiting to take a shower all at the same time. That's part of it. I think that's why it's harder for guys in corn and soybean systems to back off fertility. 
You get in the reduced till, there's a few guys doing the bio strip till, which I think is really, really cool. They're planting radish or something that's gonna frost kill in the rows that they wanna plant corn into. And then they're planting another mix of covers in between. The one guy I think of is Joe Brecker up in North Dakota is doing a lot of this type stuff. And so then that frost kills in the middle, he's got a nice bare strip, so to say, low residue strip, right where he wants to put his corn. He thinks his corn does better in our environments that way. And yet he still has residue cover for reduced erosion and good soil structure that he can terminate whenever he wants. And so that's, that's another way of doing it. So it's a strip till, but it's not till. It's just using biology to do that. All right, running low on time. When, so some of my things on this is separating intercrops. And I, Derek talked about it. Did you see his plant? That's just something you can throw together tomorrow, right? <laughs> even, even the first one, right? With the three trucks and four augers and returns and, and back and forth. And yeah, he's one good man can run it. I had no doubt in that. But how long did it take one good man to figure out how to do that? And make it work. So, so to keep this stuff in mind, like when you have these really good ideas, okay, I'm going to mix this and that, and I'm going to get double the crop, and this one's worth this, and this one's worth that. How are you going to get them separated to do that? We've seen guys screw this up with rye and hairy vetch. Cereal rye and hairy vetch. They're actually pretty close in size. They can be separated, but not cheaply. And if you're just going to expect your sea cleaner guy to do it, he might not be able to do it. He might not want to do it. And it might cost you a lot of money to do it. So think about that before you start mixing things together. How are you going to get them apart? Because otherwise you've got a really expensive cover crop mix. Okay? That's anything. But... And then the other thing about these, these things, when you're stretching it out, adding different crops, adding different timings, the planting never stops, the harvesting never stops. There's, there's no seasons anymore. That can be good and bad both, right? So it changes how things are, are happening. So labor gets to be a significant issue. And weather's always a problem. We're talking about biological systems that need rain and the right amount of temperature and heat to do what you want them to do. We don't always get that. But here's some of this cool stuff. This is one of my favorite farmers. He hates having his picture, uh, his face on the picture, so he's always ducking away. This radish is 28 days old. Planted after field peas. Love that radish. It's doing exactly what we wanted it to do. This is in a mix of other things, and we, we have reasons for every crop in there. We have a reason to put them all in there. Um, this is, he went to stripper header and more control traffic. So just the grain cart doesn't wander through the field, it follows the tracks. That's the biggest issue because it makes it easier for him to seed after the stripper header instead of laying the, the, the straw in different directions. It's not necessarily controlled traffic, but it kind of is. Uh, adding multiple systems into this, this is four species mix. I'm cool with that. You want to do more, great, but we're covering a lot of bases. Cool season grass, warm season grass, cool season broadleaf and a legume in four species. Pretty cool. And to separate the seeds, this is with a disc drill, one's small seeds in the back tank, larger seeds in a bigger tank. We actually threw a little pea with this, and you can yell at me for that. It's set up for corn. This guy's not quite there where the biology's working the way it needs to. Yeehaw. And so he's getting multiple things. He's getting his phosphorus supplied. He's getting a cover crop out there. He's getting things prepped up. It's working. This is saline spot where we're planting soybeans. and. And the idea was that we knew the soybeans weren't going to grow here, so instead of 1152, we put barley in the back tank because it grows better there. The idea was that the grower would shut the soybeans off when he hits this. He didn't necessarily because they might grow. But he did turn the barley on, which is a good thing. Obviously, the soybeans did not grow. The barley did. And now i got a cover crop in my soybeans. It doesn't have to be on every acre. We needed it on these acres. It helped reduce the salinity. It helps manage the kochia. It helps do a lot of things. We got a little creative with our herbicides and we never killed the barley. It's doable. This is uh, the intercropping. They call them, Atlanta called it fleas, flax and peas. Um, and the idea here was just to get the flax to hold the peas up. These are, these are yellow peas and they're always flat on the ground at the end of the year. And harvesting at one mile an hour in one direction is pretty hateful. But the guy makes good money on him. He loves the peas for the cover cropping, all that kind of stuff. We put some flax in there. We did two different rates, 12 pounds on one, 20 pounds on the other. He did two acres or three acres of each just to try it. It was amazing. It held the peas up to this height. 
And we think we gained a lot of bushels just because we weren't on the ground with the vacuum cleaner attachment on the combine. And he was able to triple his harvest speed. He was up to almost three miles an hour, three and a half mile an hour. And he was thrilled about it. We're gonna do more of it. Did it help with diseases? I don't know. It helped hold the peas up, it was worth it. There's some flax in there he's gotta separate. Peas and flax are big, it's easy to separate. This is a later picture. The flax was a little bit late compared to the peas. We were gonna look for an earlier variety of flax. This is some bio strip till. These are fava beans planted into cereal rye. This was a trial. The idea here is that fava bean is pretty cold tolerant. It grows up really well, uses a fair amount of water. It would help dry out the strip and the residue turns black. It, it, it grew corn. I don't know, it was this year, so eh, I don't know. It worked. I guess. <laughs> I don't know if it was worth doing, but it's worth trying. I got a few minutes left? Yeah? Okay, so um, we have to do this too. Is it working? Are, are you gaining? And there's some really easy ways to do this. There are, there are some cool soil health tests that you can send to the lab, absolutely, with the shovel. And these guys give out shovels and everybody talks about shovels. The shovel's your friend. It's the most important tool that you have. You take the shovel, you look for aggregates, you can do some infiltration, you look at this lake test. These are easy things that every one of you can do on your farm. It's not hard to do. And I think you should be doing it. Both early on, middle, later, every couple of years, you should be doing this. You pick up a new quarter, do this. If you don't have new land, go to the neighbor's land and compare it to yours, that kind of thing. What do you think of that soil, folks? That one's got a ways to go, huh? Be pretty good to make bricks out of. This one's pretty lumpy and chunky and not a whole lot of structure. You can see that there was a slab cut out of here and there's really no pore spaces. There's not a whole lot of biology. There's roots in there. There's residue in there. There's no wormholes. There's no structure. There's none of that. This is what I want your stuff to look like, okay? Now notice there's a fracture layer here. This is a compaction zone. This is a natural compaction zone based on a soil texture change. This was not built by traffic or, plant or driving across. This is natural inherent to this soil, it's there. It's not restrictive, but it's there. So not everything's gonna just go away. This is, these are my favorite pictures. This is, I love to do this, take a handful of soil and take pictures. These are the aggregates, folks, and if you don't know what I'm looking for in a shovel, this is it. I don't want to see flour, I don't want to see fluff. I want to see Lego blocks and chunks. I want to see your soil held together in these aggregates. I'm not particularly concerned about what shape they are, but some soil scientists are. These shapes are fine. This is a loamy soil. This is 60% clay, and look at how wet that is. That is glistening with water. That first shovel I showed you, that slab of dirt, was across the road, okay? This is what it can look like, and it can hold you up, and it can be structural. And this is 70% sand. You can see the sand grains in there. You can build structure in every soil. How good a structure does depend on what texture you're working with that matters, but you can build it. I wanna see roots and biology. This is not a compaction layer. It's an obvious layer. Roots don't like to grow through water, standing water. This field was very, very wet. One of the reasons we threw radishes in it. When this radish grew down early on, there was a water restrictive layer right here. And the roots would rather be in some oxygenated wet soil than total water. As that went down, the roots go down. Not every root deviation is compaction. Water infiltration test. Slake test. This is it. Stick with the science. Be questioning. Watch out for experts, including me, especially me, maybe even. Just because it's my opinion doesn't make me right. That's what I had. I don't know if I went too long. Okay, I went a little long. One or two questions, I guess. I'll be around too. You know, one thing I want to let I want to let people know is that we were lucky enough that the last two years that Lee came down to our soil health school. So 
how would you like to be around this for two and a half days? <laughs> That's not a good thing. When you're out in the field, you're actually where he's running the soil through his fingers and he's explaining that and he's getting his, his magnifying glass out, showing you the, the mycorrhizae and stuff. So uh, if you guys are even thinking about going to soil health school, we hope to entertain him again. I'm game. But uh, anyway, so do we got time for a couple? Okay, we got any questions? Perhaps a, a dirty word, but I'm going to bring it up. Uh, drainage. Yeah. No, move water. Yeah, move water. So the question is, what about drain tile for saline spots? So um, the issue with salinity is water. Water is the main issue. It dissolves the salts in the soils, brings them to the surface. That's what happened. Evaporation is your enemy. Tillage makes saline worse every time. I can prove it. Okay. It'll cover up the white, but it makes saline worse. So moving the water. So there's two ways to move water. There's plants and there's pipes. Those are the two ways to move water. When you're moving it through a plant, the plant takes it up through the roots and evaporates it to the air. So your, your sink or your source or your, your, where you're depositing the water is in the water vapor in the air. When you run pipes, you've got to have a place to put the water. So in my territory, some of these saline spots could be drained with tile drainage to move the water, but some of these don't have outlets. So that's, to me, that's one of the largest things. The other thing about this, and this is, I love saying this too, so I'm glad. I used to play basketball. I don't do that anymore. Maybe I should, but I don't. I've changed. I've gone through aging. Your soils age and change. These saline areas may have been the best in 88 and 89 when we were really dry. They're no longer the best areas because of the water that's been there for so long. They've changed and dried. So a significant investment in tile may not pay you back very well because I'm never going to play basketball again. I can lose weight, but I'm never going to play basketball again. So they can get better, but it may not get good enough that you can get the money back off of that. And I think some of these saline areas should never ever be planted to susceptible crops again, two of the most susceptible are corn and soybean. We got time for one more question. Someone's got to have one. It's way too much talent up here not to ask a question. <laughs> you bra bragging me up too much, Danny. Okay, here we go. We're going to talk to our friends from Canada. Uh, by adding flax to your peas in the polycrop, did that eliminate the fungicide application? We haven't been using the fungicide because we haven't seen significant enough results. So we did use it just to see if we could get something out of it. Um, so I, I'm not in an area that grows a lot of peas. Okay, keep that in mind. So there's very few peas. I think that adds to why I don't have as much disease. And we just try to harvest them early. Um, we did flax and peas and a strip with fungicide. And we did peas without flax and a strip of fungicide. And we couldn't see any differences in the fungicide applications for yield. That's what I can say. I, didn't, I had a ton of disease this year because we were stupid wet. And the fungicide didn't do a whole lot to the disease because we had so much pressure. In chickpeas, I think it will every time. But I don't know about field peas. As Lee stated, he'll be around, for, and don't be afraid, because Lee's really a, you know, he's just such a really caring person, and if he can help somebody, he's willing to do it, so 